Good morning. How's everybody doing? Are you tired? Yeah. Well, I understand if you are. It was a late night. Um, this morning I'm going to share, and um, then Vicky comes, and then we'll be back up again, and we'll talk probably more about the things we've been talking about, about the brain and so forth then. But I'm going to share with you a little bit uh, a presentation entitled, Did Darwin Murder God? Did Darwin murder God? And that's a good question. You know, some time ago, quite a few years, Time Magazine put out a cover story with the question, Is God Dead? It's been said that Darwin said, I did not mean to murder God, but I did. Now, what a thought. So I have a question. Did Darwin bring us to the point where there is no longer any legitimate reason for believing that there is a God? We're going to find out. We're going to look at science, and we're going to try to answer this question. You know, Bertrand Russell, British philosopher and mathematician, this man is a great skeptic who did not believe in God, did not believe in the Bible. Someone asked, they asked him, if you meet God after you die, what will you say to him to justify your unbelief? He said, I will tell him that he did not give me enough evidence. So I asked the question, is there so much evidence for the theory of evolution that the evidence of Scripture just crumbles or pales in, in contrast? Well, before we even answer that question, I want to ask the question, can't we just believe in evolution and the Bible? I mean, can't we just harmonize the two, put, them, put the two together, and, and, and then we can just, you know, say like, okay, we believe in, you know, science and and we believe in the Bible. Well, I'll tell you, I do believe in science and I do believe in the Bible. But I don't believe in evolution. Because I don't believe it's actually good science. But I'm going to show you why. Don't take my word for it. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 tells us, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and what? Death by sin. And so that death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. The Bible says that... Sin brought about death. And who brought about sin? One man, Adam. So according to the Bible, when did death begin? Yes, it wasn't until after Adam sinned. Now, this is the thing. Can we harmonize the idea of evolution, which teaches that there was, you know, a kind of a one-celled microbe that slowly... Uh, replicated over time and it grew into different microbes that finally turned into higher orders of species, finally came up to be mammals and finally came to be humans. So, but to get to that point, you had to have countless billions of deaths. Yes or no? So could you actually harmonize Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3, could you actually harmonize that with the evolutionary theory, yes or no? no? You can't really do it. So it's not just an issue of, uh, you know, would we like to? And some Christians, so what they do is they say, well, you know, it's kind of metaphorical. It, was, it didn't really mean what it said. It was kind of, you know, they were, they were explaining it in a way that, you know, ancient man could understand it. Well, ancient man would have simply been under, able to understand that slowly we changed from animal to this. I mean, they, they would have been like, okay, yeah, if that's what happened, that's what happened, right? I mean, God could have simply said that. But before we go into the science, I'm going to ask a question. Faith, what is it? Is faith a, you, you tell me, is it, is it a religious or a secular word? It's a religious word, right? So faith is a religious word. And so because of that, if it is a religious word, that means it probably would do well to have a religious definition, Right? I mean, if it's a religious word, well, then you probably look to religion to find out, well, what, what, what is faith? And the Bible tells us, you've probably heard this verse many times, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, faith 
is believing that you have evidence for something you have never seen, right? So have you ever seen God? Yes or no? So if you believe in him, you're believing it based upon faith. Now, a good Christian, though, will not believe it just on blind faith, but they would want to have good and legitimate evidence for what they believe, right? Because faith is the substance of things, hopefully the evidence of things not seen. So to actually believe, hey, I have good evidence why I believe what I believe. Just like, for instance, one of the great evidences of belief in Scripture is we have historical evidence that the events that the Bible talks about, many of them can be shown to be historically verified. We have archaeological evidence that backs up the veracity of the scriptures. We have one of the things that I find to be the most powerful is prophetic consistency. God said time and time again, specific events would be, would be fulfilled throughout earth's history, and it is as if history has been following the Bible like a blueprint. And to me, and God says in Isaiah, he says that God told us the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. And Jesus said the same thing in the book of John. He says, and now I tell you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, you might believe. So he said, I'll give you evidence so that when it takes place, you'll know, you'll say, hey, whoa, he was right. He was speaking the truth. And so we have evidences, and those are just three simple. We, we could go on to more, um, but that's not the point of this message this morning. So uh, the trouble is, though, that the evolutionists say, this is a fallacy of the evolutionists. They say, you have faith, but we have science. You can go on and believe your stories from old books, but we believe based on only empirically, you know, uh, empirical science. Something, something that can be tested, can be falsified. But let's think about this for a moment. Do evolutionists have faith? Do they actually have faith? Let's think this through. This is, this is a secular periodical from the United States called Discover Magazine. And on the cover of this particular issue, it says, where did everything come from? And then down there at the bottom, you see this area that I circled, or not circled, put in a red box. If I blow it up, this tells us how the universe came into being. What it says is, the universe burst into something from absolutely nothing. Zero, nada. And as it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. How is that possible? Ask Alan Guth. His theory of inflation helps explain everything. This here is the scientific definition of how you came to be. Where did everything come from? The scientists teach, they teach, this, this is the actual scientific, I'm, I'm not making this up and trying to be pejorative or putting people down, but the actual scientific teaching is that there was a time when there was no time, space, matter, or energy. There was absolutely nothing. There was nothing. And they said it. The universe burst into something from absolutely nothing. You get that? It's not as if there was, there was this pre-existing matter, they believe, and that pre-existing matter exploded and became the universe. There was absolutely nothing. And the absolutely nothing exploded. Now let me ask you a question. How could nothing explode? That's a good question, right? So this is the idea, absolutely nothing exploded, and it became filled with more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. This is the scientific understanding of where everything came from. So let me ask you a question. Did anybody see the Big Bang? So if they believe they have evidence for something they've never seen, according to the biblical definition of faith, do they have it? They most absolutely do. That evolution rests upon a foundation of faith. Nobody ever saw it. But they say, hey, yeah, but we, we, the stars are actually moving apart. There's something called red shift that we can see as we, as we look out there. And that means they're moving further away. So that means they used to be closer. So therefore, it was all coming from a central point. But that's evidence based on something you've never seen. Nobody ever saw the Big Bang. Nobody ever saw it start. Nobody has any idea how nothing could become something. We have no idea. But it's interesting that the Bible teaches a similar idea, that there was a time where there was 
no time, space, matter, or energy outside of God. And then there was a beginning. God said, let there be. Now you say, Chad, but that's faith. You, you didn't see God make it. Absolutely. I have faith. But you realize the evolutionist stands on the same footing as the creationist, that we both begin with something we've never seen. But let's go even further. So that's just the formation of matter and stars. And, but let's go on. Let's just say, you know, could, what do we really think? So the Big Bang, is, is it really solid? I mean, is this something that is just, this is replicable science. You can't replicate the Big Bang, right? You can't create something from nothing again to prove that it could happen, right? But let's notice this. This is taken from another secular periodical in the United States, New Scientist. And what it says here, speaking of the Big Bang, its author, David Darling, says, speaking of the Big Bang, how could it happen? How could nothing become something? And he says, don't let the cosmologists try to kid you on this one. They have not got a clue either. Despite the fact that they are doing a pretty good job of convincing themselves and others that this is really not a problem. In the beginning, they will say there was nothing, no time, space, matter, or energy. Then there was a quantum fluctuation from which, and then he says, whoa, stop right there. You see what I mean? First there is something, then there is nothing, and the cosmologists try to bridge the two with a quantum flutter. Now, you know what a quantum flutter is? Two big words. It's just two simply big words. You, put, you make up big words, and it sounds like it must be Scientific. Because you wouldn't make up big words for something that didn't exist. But nobody's ever seen a quantum flutter, right? We can't, we can't make one. We can't test it. We can't put it in a test tube and, and look at it and then have other scientists replicate the same thing. It just can't happen. We don't know how something could become nothing. And this honest scientist, this is not some creationist sitting in one of our, you know, you know sitting at Newbold, right? This, or sitting at Anders or what, what have you. This is just a secular scientist saying, listen, we don't have a clue how nothing could become something, and don't let the cosmologists try to trick you about this. They don't know any better than you would know. Because the fact is, nobody could ever prove that nothing could become something. You understand what I'm saying? So to believe it, even if you believed it, even if you thought you had some evidence for something becoming nothing, and no, or nothing becoming something, you would still believe partly based on faith, because you weren't there to see it happen. So, is the Big Bang science or faith? According to the, the biblical definition, it is actually faith, because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And according to this scientist we just read, they don't even have evidence for it at all. So, this is not even good faith, because good faith is based upon evidence. So, this is based upon Nothing. You understand what I'm saying? So this is blind faith. The evolutionist begins on the foundation of something nobody's ever seen without any evidence for nothing becoming something. It's blind faith in the beginning, the beginning of the universe. So evolution has the solid foundation of blind faith. But at least the Christian starts with faith based upon Evidence. Now, this is very interesting. We're going to go further, though. So, okay, let's just, let's just give it to the evolutionists and just, let's just imagine for a moment that, that what they said was true, that nothing became something miraculously in a great miracle 4.6 billion years ago. But then, how did life come about? How did life start from non-life? This is another serious issue, another secular periodical, New Scientist, 2003, and this article in here is called Born Lucky. And the subcaption says, against all the odds, life established itself remarkably quickly on Earth. Does this tell us anything about where it began? Yes, says theoretical physicist Paul Davies, and the answer is out of this world. So, then we go into the article, and he talks about, so how did it happen? There was no life on planet Earth, according to the evolutionary theory. And then life sprouted up, sprung up, and the question is, how? How did it actually happen? You say, oh, but they taught us in our, in our textbooks. But when you get to the top scientists, you want to hear their definition of how it actually happened? See, in the textbooks, they'll tell you absolute fairy tales and act like it's true. But when the top scientists are actually, when they speak with candor, when they're forthright about what they actually know for a fact of how it began, this is what we read. This is theoretical physicist Paul Davies. He says, nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organize themselves, in, themselves into the first living cell. 
So this man, in all honesty, in a secular periodical, just says, listen, we don't have a clue. We don't have a clue how you could have water, chemicals, and those chemicals come together to create a living cell. He says, we have no idea how that happened. Isn't that interesting? So that means if you have no idea, that means you don't have any evidence. So if you don't have any evidence and you believe in something, you're believing not even in good faith, you're believing on blind faith. Do you understand? Once again, God's people are not to believe based on blind faith. God gives many evidences of who he is. Number one, we partly are relying on the testimony of other people. But are you not also, when you go to your biology course, relying on the testimony of others? How many of you have done all the studies in your scientific textbooks, right? You're actually believing based upon the testimony of another, right? I mean, at least Moses claimed to have seen God, right? We have something. Nobody saw the Big Bang. Nobody saw the first living cell created. Not only that, we don't even have a clue how it could have happened. We don't even know. We have no evidence for it, right? And so what we're seeing here is that the foundation, but when you go to school, it's so amazing. When you read the lower level textbooks in maybe your primary or secondary school, in the beginning, it's spoken of as if it is rock solid science. But as you get higher and higher and higher up, and once you break the ceiling of maybe even graduate school and actually go read the scientific journals themselves, not the textbooks that are trying to indoctrinate you, when you go read the actual scientific journals, you'll realize that scientists are not as solid. I mean, somebody asked Richard Dawkins, the foremost atheist on planet Earth, they said, how did it happen? How did life come about from non-life? And you know what his answer was? We have no idea, but we're working on it. Isn't that interesting? And this man's no dummy. He's very intelligent. I'm, I'm not knocking the intelligence of these scientists. They're very intelligent. But the thing is, they still don't know how non-life could become life. They don't know how nothing could become something because you never could know, right? How nothing could become something. I mean, this, I mean, this sounds like something. Mean, it is impossible to know these things. Now, it's interesting. Sir Fred Hoyle who died back in 2001. He's the guy who termed or coined the term the Big Bang. So he's the guy who gave that terminology. And it's interesting, he talks about the chances that higher life forms could emerge by, by the, the process of evolution. How could it be that uh, life forms could continually progress to higher life forms, maybe like a human or such? And he, he talks about the, the random mathematical probability of that happening. And to give an illustration of it, he said this. You may have heard this before. He, he refers it to, uh, he said the probability is 10 to the 40,000th power. And that's, that's such an astronomical number. We can't even contemplate it. So, or we can't even conceive of it, I should say. Um, and then he says, the chance that higher life forms might have emerged in this way is comparable with the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 airplane from the materials therein. Do you understand what he's saying? You know, I've lived in Arkansas. I've done some meetings in Arkansas, and I've seen areas where the tornadoes just rip through. I mean, you, just, there's just, you can just see. We actually went and visited a house, and we went into these, these people's house, and they, uh, they brought us down to their, they have what, what they call storm shelters, Meaning when the weather gets really bad and the, and the sirens go off to tell you tornadoes may be coming, people go down in their storm shelters. They're under the ground or they're maybe not in the ground all the time. Some of them are underground, uh, but some of them are above ground, but they're just hard uh, cement blocks, you know. And they got in their storm shelter and the tornado came and it went right over their house and it got, it just got extremely loud. Finally, it quieted down. And the husband said, I'm going to go outside and look. So he went outside, and he looked, and then he came back into the storm shelter, and his wife said, is it bad? And he said, it's very bad. The entire house was gone. It wasn't like over to the side or in a heap, you know, right there. It was just gone. The house disappeared. And we, we were visiting the house. It was after the fact, and they had already rebuilt at that time, and so we got to see the house at that point. And, and there was just a, a path of destruction, like a, like a uh, pathway that the tornado, it was the longest tornado on record. It went like, I don't know, like 120 miles nonstop. It just kept moving. 
And so the point being, he says, listen, the chances that higher life forms could emerge in this way is like a tornado coming into a junkyard, stirring up the junkyard. And after the, after the tornado gets through, it had assembled a perfectly formed Boeing 747 airplane from what was found in the junkyard. But I would go even further than that. If you had a tornado make an airplane, it wouldn't just have to be an airplane sitting there. The airplane would have to have fuel in the engine and would have to be turned on and then able to go forth and replicate itself. You understand? It's a whole nother level. Because even if evolution by random chance or by random chance life came about, does that, ran, that, does that cell then know how to duplicate itself? You understand what I'm saying? Number one, it has to go obtain some kind of nutrition, and then it has to replicate itself over and over and over until you and I appear sitting on these chairs in 2016, right? So the idea that this could happen by random chance is infinitely impossible. And the scientists are beginning to recognize these things because Fred Hoyle was not a creationist, mind you. This guy was not some friend of, you know, like, like some guy who we, we, you know, we would love to go and talk to. I mean, the poor fellow, he's gone now. But the point being, this man was not some kind of Christian backing up our theory. He was just saying, look at the reality of it all. We have no idea how this possibly could have happened. And then he says, of adherence of biological evolution, Hoyle said he was at a loss to understand biologists' widespread compulsion to deny what seems to me to be so obvious. He said, it's obvious this couldn't happen by random chance, yet he was no creationist. New York Times some time ago said, everything about the origin of life on earth is a mystery. And it seems the more that is known, the more acute the puzzle get. The puzzles get. So what they're saying is the more that we know, because it used to be that in Darwin's day, we knew that cells were very simple things, Right? They were very simple, and so to make something like that would not be very difficult. But now, with, the more inf- with more information that we have about cells, we realize these things are infinitely complex. And so we realize so much more than Darwin did. And it's interesting because today, powerful technologies reveal elaborate microscopic worlds. Worlds so small that a thimble full of cultured liquid can contain more than 4 billion single-celled bacteria each packed with circuits, assembly instructions, and miniature machines, the complexity of which Charles Darwin would have never imagined. He had no clue how complex these things were. Now, you may have heard of this book that came out years ago called Darwin's Black Box by Michael Behe. And he came up with a a very interesting idea. He calls it irreducible complexity. That when you strip things down, you get to a point where you can't reduce it anymore and have a organism still function. For, for instance, like a car. Your car can run just fine. You can take off the uh, rear view mirror, right? You can, you can knock off the windshield. You can take off the bumper. You can do all kinds of things. You, know, you can take out the seats, and the car will still run. You can still hit the gas pedal, but there's certain parts of the engine that If you take them out, the car just will not function, right? And so he talked about this in the context of organisms. And he gives an example of something called the bacterial flagellar motor, or the flagellum. And what it is, is on on a, a, a bacteria, you have this little appendage. And it, it actually spins like a motor to propel it through, uh, you know, whatever substance that the bacteria is in. So it moves, you know, kind of like a motorboat, and it's spinning, and it can spin. I mean, the, the, the rate at which it spins is just, you know, astronomical. It's amazing. And so, but it propels it through, but it takes different protein parts to make that motor. And we read here, it says, all told, there are about 40 protein parts which are necessary for this machine to work. And if any of those parts are missing, then you either get a flagellum that doesn't work because it is missing the hook or it is missing the drive shaft or whatever, or it doesn't even get built within the cell. So meaning you have these 40 different parts in the motor, and all of them have to be there at the same time 
in order for this thing to work. Or it would just be an appendage that might actually be a detriment to the cell itself or to the, or to the bacteria anyway, right? And so you need all 40 parts. And, but the thing is you say, well, what does that matter? Because remember, evolution doesn't teach that everything came together at once. It tells us that they were simpler life forms that became more complex over time. So, you know, you know, a little you know, piece of DNA added to another piece of DNA, or one protein added to another, to another, to another, to finally make you and I over time. But what do we see? Howard Berg of Harvard says the bacterial flagellar motor is the most efficient machine in the universe. And they say it can, it can spin at something like 200,000 RPM, rotations per minute, 200,000 RPMs, and then it can stop on a quarter turn. I mean, can you imagine something spinning that fast and stopping on a quarter turn? And then it can reverse its turn and, and turn the other way at 200,000 know, RPMs. And so he says this is the most efficient machine in the universe. See, but it couldn't have been made through slight successive modifications. And notice what Charles Darwin himself said. He said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous, successive, slight modifications, my theory would absolutely what? Break down. But I can find no such case. So he said, if you could find an organ that existed in nature that couldn't be made through small, continual modifications, my whole theory would just crash to the floor. And he said, but I can't find anything like that. Everything seems to fit. Have we found anything today, yes or no? Yes, we have. We have the bacterial flagellar motor, and that's only one example of, of organs that exist that couldn't, make, couldn't be made through just random chance, meaning all these things had to be there right there at the beginning, right there together. And so according to Darwin's own admission, his theory today does not hold water as it once did. But you say, Chad, but Christians still live by faith, but the evolutionists have all the science. We're already beginning to see what is considered to be science is not actually science at all. But the thing is, it looks like science when you read it in a textbook. Because the people who write the textbooks have great faith in what they believe. And so they speak with grand authority. And when you read it, you think they've actually proven these things. And as I've already said, when you read the actual uh, journals by the top scientists, they'll say, yeah, yeah, we're not as solid on this stuff as we make it out to be in the textbooks. The textbooks, it's kind of like, ah, I won't even go into it. It's kind of like, never mind, never mind. So, okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And I'm going to tell you, evolutionists walk by faith and not by sight. We're on the same foundation. I'm not saying we're different in that area, but we believe that we need some good evidence but many of them acknowledge. This is very interesting. So I want you to think of what Francis Crick said. And Francis Crick said, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather what? Evolved. So what does he say? He said biologists, as they're studying life, as they're studying an organism or an organ, as they are looking at it, they must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not what? Designed, but rather evolved. Now let me ask you a question. Why would they have to constantly remind themselves this wasn't designed? Because it looks like it was designed. So what he's saying, do not walk by sight. Walk by faith in the theory of evolution. Do you understand what I'm saying? He says, do not live by what you see with your own eyes, with your own senses. Don't trust your senses. Trust in the word of scientists. Do you see where we're going with this? Trusting in the word of man. You get the idea. And so I'm not putting them down saying they're dumb. These people are extremely intelligent people. They understand aspects of, of the physiology of human life. There's no question. Very intelligent people. I'm not degrading there. But, but what I am questioning is the fact that they purport things in the textbooks at the lower educational levels, and as they get to the top, they actually acknowledge that these things are actually just straight up not solid. And so what they say, though, is live by faith and not by sight. That's very interesting. Um, 
Let's go even further. This is quite powerful. You may have heard of the, it's, it's been called the monkey theorem or the infinite monkey theorem. Has anybody ever heard of it? At least one of us. Okay, now here, here's how it works. Basically what they say, you know, I took that picture. I was actually, I was at a zoo and I had a camera on me and he, the guy, he turned to me like this, looked at me and I got the picture right at the right time. I love that picture, right? Uh, they're so intelligent, those creatures. But nevertheless, so he's not a monkey anyway. It's just that I, I took the picture, so I threw it in there. But nevertheless, so, um, you know, the infinite monkey theorem works like this. The idea is that, okay, this is how life came about or higher levels of order came about by the, by the gathering together of information by random chance. So proteins gathered together to form the first living creatures and then it slowly evolved. And it's kind of like this because we know that DNA is a form of information, right? It's like an encyclopedias of information as it were. And the idea is that it got more complex over time, simple to complex. Well, the infinite monkey theorem tells us that if you had an infinite number of monkeys, and those infinite number of monkeys were just typing away on on a keyboard, if, if they typed long enough just by random chance, if you had millions and millions and millions just randomly doing this, that sooner or later... This, this is the actual theory, I'm not making this up, that sooner or later it's been said that they would randomly by chance type out one of Shakespeare's plays. Have you heard that before? That's the idea. That by random chance they would actually type out, if you gave them enough, if there were enough monkeys and you gave them enough time, they would type out by random chance one of Shakespeare's plays. Do you think that's true? You know what's good news? The British people did a study on it. (laughs) The British National Council of Arts. The thing is, the Brits didn't have an infinite number of monkeys, so they used six. (laughs) They had six monkeys, but they actually did the study, and they gave them one computer, and they gave them one month, and they wanted to see, well, how much could they type out in one month if they were just randomly typing away on a computer. You say, well, Chad, that's not enough. That's not millions and billions of monkeys. But, but just, just to figure out, we could actually do the mathematical you know, calculations to figure out, well, how much did they type out accurately? And that would give us an idea how long it would take for it to actually type out one of Shakespeare's plays. Well, they gave them this time period. This is uh, Anthony Flew in a book that I read some time ago called um, uh, There Is a God. Anthony Flew was one of the foremost philosophical atheists on the planet before Richard Dawkins. And this man went from being an agnostic, actually an atheist, fully not believing in God, to finally saying that there must be a God. And I'll get to that in just a moment. But he, he's the one, he was in a debate with a Christian man, and the Christian man, they began to go over this information right here. So this information that I'm sharing with you was, was shared with this, uh, you know, skeptic, this, this man who would debate against the Christian faith. So what were the results of these monkeys? They actually, over the course of that month, those six monkeys on one computer typed out 50 pages. So I want you to guess for a moment, and if you already know this, don't guess, but does anybody want to guess how many words out of the 50 pages that were typed out by these monkeys, how many words did they type out? Somebody said none? The answer is actually they typed out zero words correctly. Now, you say, what do you mean they typed out zero words correctly? What about the word, what are the shortest words in the English language? I and A. Are you telling me they never typed out I or they never typed an A? The thing is this. Did you know that the word A is only the word A when you have a space on either side of it? Same with I. You understand what I'm saying? So these monkeys did not type out one correct word in a month, typing out 50 pages. So zero words there. So we already mentioned this. I don't need it. The shortest words in the English language are A and I. And so then Schroeder, in this debate, he's debating with Anthony Flew, who later becomes a, at, at least a deist, at least someone who believes in God. He said all the sonnets 
are the same length. Okay, let me, let me back up. Finally, they said, okay, the idea that, someone would, that the monkeys would type out by random chance a play, I mean, a massive play, okay, that's a little bit extreme. But maybe a sonnet. Sonnets are much shorter, right? So maybe, maybe random chance they could type out a sonnet. So he, t- he looked at this. He said, all the sonnets are the same length. They're by definition 14 lines long. That's pretty short. I picked the one I knew the opening line for. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Not the. Uh, I counted the number of letters. There are 488 letters in that sonnet. What's the likelihood of hammering away and getting 448 letters in the exact sequence, as in, shall I compare thee, did it again, to a summer's day? What you end up with is 26 multiplied by itself 488 times, or 26 to the 488th power, or, in other words, in base 10, 10 to the 690th power. We say, what does that even mean? I don't even know what that means. Well, we'll get to that in just a second. So let's find out. So 10, this, this number is so massive. 10 to the 80th power, to give you an idea, is theoretically, scientists think that this is the number of atoms in the entire universe. Does that make sense? So 10 to 8, it doesn't look like a very big number, but 10 to the 80th atoms is theoretically, they guess, and I have no idea how they could figure that out, but they, they, they guess that that's about the number of atoms in the entire universe. Well, what was the chance that these monkeys could hammer out just a short sonnet, 14 lines of writing? The chance was 10 to the 690th power. Do you understand this? That the chance, it would be like if, if you were to go out, this would be millions and millions of universes the size of our universe. And if you were to take, like, let's say, I don't know, a chicken, and imagine the whole, those universes are just filled with, with uh, you know, let's say, pieces of corn. And you were to send a chicken out into the universe. And only one of those pieces of corn was from blue corn. All the rest were from yellow and you were sending them into those millions of universes, and he had one try to get it right. The chances that he would get it right would be 10 to the 690th power. Is that a good chance, yes or no? It's impossible. It is impossible that it would ever happen by random chance. So it's just not going to happen. So Anthony Flew, as they're in this debate, this guy's the skeptic. After this situation, Anthony Flew said, after hearing Schroeder's presentation, he said, in a nice British way, I told him that he had very satisfactorily and decisively established that the monkey theorem was a load of what? Rubbish. So notice this man who's a great skeptic. He says, listen, I recognize this is not a good argument. These evolutionists have used this argument to buttress or to hold up their idea of evolution. But when when it actually is tested in even any capacity, you'll see, no, this is not solid science. So he goes on to say, You will never get a sonnet by chance, yet the world just thinks the monkeys can do it every time. Right? This is interesting. So this idea is not so solid, not solid at all, actually. And as I said, Anthony Flew wrote this book, There is no God, crosses out the no, and there is a God. And I want you to notice, why did this man, who was an atheist for years, debated Christians, I mean, you you can imagine, he didn't want to accept the, you know, the, the idea that there is a God. I mean, this man fought it for years, for the better part of his life. And then he says this, my departure from atheism was not occasioned by any new phenomenon or argument. Over the last two decades, my whole framework of thought has been in a state of migration. This was a, cons- a consequence of my continuing assessment of the evidence of what? Nature. So notice, nature seemed to have evidence that pointed him to a creator. Isn't that interesting? So if you actually open, you would see that there is evidence in nature that there must have been a divine hand presiding in those works. And so this is very interesting. He said it was the evidence of nature. He said, when I finally came to recognize the existence of a God, It was not a paradigm shift because my paradigm remains as Plato in his Republic scripted his Socrates to insist we must follow the argument, what? Wherever it leads. Do you get this? 
This man is saying, listen, my whole theory since the very beginning was I wanted to follow the evidence wherever it went. As an atheist, I was doing that. But as science has evolved, he said, we come to, I come to the conclusion, he says, that there must have been a God. There must have been a creator. And this is a man who didn't want there to be a creator. But as he looks at the science, he says, there had to have been God. There's evidence in nature that these things could not have happened by random chance. The Bible says this. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without what? There's no excuse. The Bible says if you will look at nature, if you look at it long enough and hard enough and close enough, you'll realize that there is no excuse for not believing that there is a God. Now, we can forgive maybe Darwin because he lived in a time where, where scientific thought and investigation was rudimentary. But now, with all the evidence we have, there's one thing that keeps people from being Christians or followers of God, I should say, is number one, because they're reading the dogmas in the biological textbooks of evolution. And so they never see. There's a, there's a proverb, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 17, which says this. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. So you sit in your classes and you're like, man, you're reading some textbook and you're like, that just seems so solid. Maybe my parents are all just kind of, you know, backward, and my pastor, he doesn't know, and I'm not putting down your pastor. I'm, I'm just saying, we just saying, man, maybe, maybe we're just kind of like covering our heads to the science, and we just, we're not willing to acknowledge reality. Remember, those are the lower-level textbooks. You get to the top of evolutionists, they're like, yeah, yeah, we're not quite sure. We have no idea how it all began. We have no idea how life could have evolved from non-life. We just don't know. And then the chance that it became higher life forms, the mathematical probability is impossible. I just don't see how people can even believe it anymore. This is what some of the top scientists say. But yet in the textbooks, remember, the dog was put in there. The religious theories are put in there. The blind faith is promoted in the textbooks. So the young kids, the one who states his case first, so you hear that first as a child, and you're just like, man, this is solid. Until the other, like the Bible says, until the other comes and examines it and shows you the other side of the story. I could show you lies in the textbook, so we may get to that a little bit, but we'll see. Richard Dawkins, how, how many of you have heard of Richard Dawkins? He, you know, he's from England. And <laughs> foremost atheist on planet Earth today, wrote The God Delusion. This man is a skeptic through and through. And I don't say this to put the man down. I actually, I, I, I've thought for years, I thought, this man is so angry. This man is such an angry man. And I shared this uh, last weekend with the, with the youth, and some of you may have been there. But uh, Richard Dawkins was so angry. And, and I always thought, listen, I don't believe in Santa Claus, but it doesn't make me angry all day long, right? I don't focus my whole life on writing, there is no Santa Claus, don't you realize, you know, like, this is deception to the poor children, you know, like, even though I think it is, I would never tell my kids there's a Santa Claus, I think it is a deception, but, but, but I don't live in a fiery rage because of it, you understand what I'm saying? And my thought was, why is he so angry? And it seemed to me that somehow deep down he must actually believe there is a God. And he's fighting with every, every inch of who he is to actually prove that this God doesn't exist. But then I wondered also, and, and you may wonder, if somebody's so angry, why? Why is the question? And then I discovered that he was actually sexually taken advantage of by someone in the church. And I actually feel bad for the man. Because his logic is probably, if this is what God is all about, who needs God? And if that's what God were all about, I wouldn't want anything to do with God either. You understand what I'm saying? If God is about raping children... But actually, the Bible says that if a man causes a child, offends a little child, it would be better that a millstone were hung about his neck and he were cast into the depths of the sea. God is not about the abuse of children. He wants to set us free. But he was in a debate. Richard Dawkins was in a debate with another Brit by the name of John Lennox. Lennox is a teddy bear. He's just like this old 
kind of pudgy man, very kind, not, not, you ought to believe in God. I mean, just very kind. I mean, Dawkins couldn't really be angry with this man because he's just jovial and kind. And so as they're debating, Lennox asks Dawkins a question to this effect, something along these lines. He asks, don't you ever feel the desire to worship? And I thought, what a weird question. And, and, my, and you would imagine his response would be, no way, I'm an evolutionist. I know there's no God. I believe in evolution. I don't believe in this junk. But you want to hear, these are the exact words of Richard Dawkins when he was asked about his desire to worship. He said, I consider, I think when you consider the beauty of the world, and when you wonder how it came to be what it is, you're naturally overwhelmed with a feeling of awe, a feeling of admiration, and you almost feel a desire to worship something. I feel this. I recognize that other scientists such as Carl Sagan feel this. Einstein felt it. We, all of us share a kind of religious reverence for the beauties of the universe, for the complexities of life, for the sheer magnitude of the con cosmos, for the sheer magnitude of geological time. Here's the foremost skeptic on planet Earth, and he says, when I look, see, I think many young people today are running around with earbuds in their ears, looking at Facebook all day, and as they're looking at these things all day long, they don't even think about eternal realities. They're so filled with nonsense that they're not even contemplating, is there a God? Look at the beauties of nature. Man, there must be a God. I think many people, they're, they're so filled with, with something in their face, they don't even think about it. But this man is not the case. This is a man who thinks about the, the you know, scope of the universe, how large the universe, looks out in the sky and marvels at the mysteries of the universe. So he's thinking about the complexities of life, and as he looks at all of these things, he is amazed and astounded by it, and he said it actually makes him want to worship. Isn't that interesting? I appreciate his candor. I appreciate his honesty. He could have just said no, but he gave us a window into his soul to see who this man is at the core of his being. He wants to worship God. That's what he says. He said Einstein felt it. Carl Sagan felt this way. The scientists who are open feel this way. But then he went on to say basically, but I believe in the theory of evolution, so I squash it. Remember, we must walk by faith and not by what we see. He's saying when I see the things of the universe, it makes me want to worship. But I follow by faith the word of man. Do you understand? And I hope by the grace of God that he too, like Anthony Flew, will someday give his life to Jesus Christ. That he will let go, that the Lord will break him free from the shame of, that he has from the past of being used by a, by a man in the church. Shame on that man. The Lord, the Lord will deal with that. But I'm going to close with something. You, you may have seen this before, but it's just such a beautiful thought. Here's planet Earth. And to give you an idea of its relative size to some of the smaller planets, here is Venus, Mars, and Mercury. So, you know, in comparison, there's some smaller, smaller planets, but we go even further. Here it is again. Can you see them there? That's planet Earth and the other smaller planets, but here is Jupiter, Neptune, Saturn, and Uranus. You're kind of small, aren't you? You're on that little one. But let's go even further. Here is, right there, you can hardly see it, right? That's planet Earth. And that is the sun. Now you look really small, don't you? Let's go even further. In this next picture, you are too small to see, so you don't make it into the next picture. This right here, that little dot is our sun, okay? Below it is Arcturus, and above it is Regal. But then you have the star, Betelgeuse. Are you beginning to realize how tiny we are? Let's go even further. This here is one pixel. I, I, I put this together with the relative sizes. That is one pixel. That's our sun. That's our, our star. This here is Antares. Right? It doesn't even fit on the screen. And, and the thing is, if I would have shrunk our sun down, you wouldn't have seen it, because that's one pixel, right? 
So let's go even further. Here is Antares, and that right there is Mu Sephi. So our sun in this picture would be too small to see, let alone trying to find planet Earth. You understand? Does this give you a, a small conception how, of how minuscule you are? It does, doesn't it? What I find interesting is you look at this and you realize, man, we really are, you know, they say like we're stardust, right? We don't seem like very much. And have you heard of Stephen Hawking? One of the most intelligent men on planet Earth, but he's stricken with a disease called ALS. He's in a wheelchair and he cannot move his body except for a, his, his index finger. The poor guy, I feel for him. And he... he, he um, somewhat of a skeptic, but he, he pens books, and when he writes things, people listen, because he's one of, the, um, you know, one of the top scientists in the world. And this is what he says when he looks out on the universe. He says, we are such insignificant creatures on a minor planet of a very average star in the outer suburbs of a hundred billion galaxies. So it is difficult to believe in a God that would care about us or even notice our existence. So he thinks we're so minuscule. How could God think about us? But you know what I find interesting? David thought the same thing but came to a different conclusion. He said, when I consider your heavens, those are, that's the sky, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? 3,000 years ago, David had the same thought. But his thought, rather than saying he wouldn't think about us, he thinks how powerful it is that God does think about us. Isn't that powerful? And friends, if we're willing to be open, we don't have to stand back and act like we're, oh, you know, we have no good evidence for what we believe. Sure, we can't prove every aspect of creation, but we can recognize that they are standing on a foundation that is sure as standing upon the waves of the sea. They have no clue how these things began. God gives us evidence that he must have been there. And even some of the, some of the atheists like Richard or, uh, Anthony Flew are saying there must be a God by the evidences of nature. So friends, God has answers if you're willing to look for them. Remember, the one who states his case first, you may be in school, and the one who states his case first seems right until you're willing to go look for the other evidence to see we do have good evidence for what we believe. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look at science and to look at your word. And we thank you that true science does not contradict your word. Yes, the theories of men with no evidence that are called science, they do contradict the word. But true science does not contradict your word in any way. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be faithful. Not to fight. We're not looking to go out and hammer evolutionists over the head. That will do no good. As your word tells us in the book of James, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. But when someone's heart is open, when someone's heart is open to the gospel, that they begin to be open to the deeper things that you've given us in your word. Pray that you would draw each and every one of us closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen.